Praise the Lord, saints of the Most High God. I greet you well in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So very good to have us all again in another Bible study. We have been spending some time over the last couple of weeks going through some matters and issues relating to the end times, and it has certainly generated quite a bit of interest. Folks are, have welcomed the study. Folks are being blessed. Folks are being edified, and that is good. Information, you know, is flowing, and we are getting a little bit more in terms of understanding some of the things that are going to be happening, the things that the Bible spoke about as being crucial part of end time living. And it is good that we are getting the information together. It is good that we are understanding. It is good that we are putting the sequencing of things in order. And I give God thanks for that. And while we are getting information, while we are understanding, while we are putting the things together, and there is a bit of interest and excitement about end time events and end time happenings, and what we are anticipating and how we are organizing to be ready, there is also another note a very somber note, a note where folks have expressed their concern. And I must tell you, you might not recognize it because we are not in an assembly where we kind of can feel the pulse of the people, so to speak. But I can tell you that I am feeling it simply because I am getting calls the, the, the questions are still coming. Uh, there is still the, the, the WhatsApp call and the WhatsApp messaging where chains are writing and asking and inquiring as to what to do to be ready. It's one thing to be excited about the things that we are hearing and the things that we are studying via this medium and other medium. It's one thing to be excited about it. But it's another thing when folks are petrified, when folks are scared, because not because of the things that are to come, but because when they examine themselves against the word of God and seeing that we are in a season that is indicating that the Lord's coming is really not very far away when we see that and understand that as individuals our lives are not ordered according to the word there is this sense of fear because we are not ready and so one goes back to the scripture in saint matthew 25 with the ten virgins and five were wise and five were foolish it is a way of life where there is always going to be those that are really not ready when the time comes and so there is this concern there is this sense of fear there is this sense of bewilderment amongst saints and the question is asked oh can i really be ready and so since last week, right into today, questions have still been coming in. You know, the text comes, sir, um, are those things really so? Folks right now are still inquiring, asking for an expansion on some of the things that we had discussed about heaven. Heaven seems uh, for some such a real place, although there is the uncertainty of what we would be like there and you know folks have asked for a little bit of expansion and then further folks are asking tell me who will the 144,000 
that remain on earth be? And what will they be doing? You know, folks are constantly asking these questions, constantly inquiring about what is to come. Tell me, go into the area, the section that deals with the millennium. Let us understand what this is about. I had no idea that after the rapture there would be anything happening on earth again. We would have been in heaven, that would have been the end of the story, and we just move on with life right after the rapture. But no, that is not how it is. After the rapture, we will be with him in heaven for a while. And after a while, we will get back down here to earth to enter into that golden age, that age when Jesus Christ rules right from Jerusalem, sitting upon the throne of his father, David, and he will be ruling. And when the Bible said in Revelation that he will be ruling with a rod of iron, when the Psalms declared that he is going to rule uh, with a rod of iron, when will this happen? Because when he was here the first time, it didn't happen. And when we get to heaven, he's not going to be ruling over his people, the church, with a rod of iron. Who then was it referring to when it said that he's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. So much to learn. So much to get into. And the questions keep coming. And so they want, the, 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 the folks, saints are expecting and they are asking for answers to these things. And we will be getting into them. We will be talking about those 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. 12,000 from each tribe. What is it? that they are going to be doing during the time when they are here. And the questions are so many. But like I said at the start, while I will go through and I will address a few more questions, there is one particular question. I should say there are about three that I have lumped together and just presenting one that summarizes the three. I will look at it in a little while, but it reflects the mood of a lot of the saints who are listening and who are learning from the series on the end times and prophecy. Our intention is not just to provide information so that we have it together and we know the sequencing and the order of things, and we can turn to a scripture here and ter turn to a scripture there and have everything together. That's not the intention. Yes, we want us to all have information. We want us to be learned. We want us to know what is happening. We want us to be adept of the events and the scriptures and the chronology of things. That is very important because it is word coming to us. It is word capturing our hearts and our imagination. And when that happens, it propels us to a closer, deeper walk with God. That's what we want. So in that sense, when the word comes and when we capture it and when we embrace it, my heart rejoices because that is really what we want. But as I said, there are those who, having heard, having received, having gone into it, they're recognizing that the things are true. But as we stand here now, folks are not ready. So that when I get that kind of feedback, I have to make some adjustments because the intention while it is to provide information, it is Bible study, it is Bible lessons, Bible class, we are teaching. But there is also an element in the session when we can feel the pulse of the people that, sir, the thing is happening. I am hearing the thing and I am learning the thing. But I realize that if the trumpet sounds tonight, I am not ready. It does something to me. 
I can go on and talk about the millennium. I can go on and talk about final events. I can go on and talk about the eternal state. I can go on and talk about the new heaven and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, where the Bible spoke about how we are going to work and relate together. I can go on and talk about the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. We can talk about so much that relates to end time things and the eternal state and so forth. But at a point or at a time when we are making the presentations and we are doing the lessons and folks are crying out, I would like to intervene in the presentation to address some matters, pertinent matters relating to the saints of the Most High God and our being ready and our making sure that we are ready. That is my duty. That is what I have to do. So even if we break a bit to interject some thoughts, some nuggets that will help us to not only hear the word and understand the word and understand what is happening, but to help us to make the necessary adjustments to our lives. Because at the end of the day, that is really what matters. What sense does it make? When we know all that is going to happen. When we understand the sequencing of things to come. And yet, like five of the ten virgins, we are still not ready. Although all ten knew that the bridegroom was coming. What sense does it make to know it all? To have it all here? And even here. And yet did not make the adjustments to set our houses in order. Having the knowledge, having the understanding, but not having the hearts being at the place where they are supposed to be. If that is the case, as I am understanding, is the case with some. I have gotten the letters. I have gotten the telephone calls. I have met with some. The Bible study is to bring us to a place of consecration. It is to bring us to a place of repentance. It is to bring us to a place of brokenness. I would want that when we go through the rest of the series, when we pick up and we, we are going through the millennium and all the other areas down the line, I would want us, and, that, and this is God's willing and the Lord tarrying, I would want when we go through the rest of this series, we are going through it together as people that are fully prepared. If our houses are not in order, if our lives are not aligned with the word, and we are just listening, and we are just being excited by the word, I would have failed. You would not have been ready. And what does it profit a man to gain everything and lose his own soul? Now is the time for introspection. Now is the time for assessment. Now is the time for stock taking. Now is the time to put our houses in order. If a man have ought against his brother, now is the time, given that we are going through these things and we are understanding and seeing that we don't have much further to go, now is the time to make it right with your brother and with your sister. Now is the time, brethren, and let me be so bold as to say, listen, if you are in the house, husbands and wives, and there are breakdowns, and there are things that are not right, we are first called to be saints. Let us first do the Christian things. Let us live as Christians. Let us allow for our Christianity.
to manifest itself not only on the roads, not only at the workplace, not only at school, but our Christianity must manifest itself in our homes. So husbands, live good with your wives. Wives, live good with your husbands. We need to understand that Christianity has a lot, has a big role, has a significant role, has a major role to play first in our homes. So let's not be all excited and jumping and skipping about the things that we are learning about end time affairs and yet the affairs at home is not in order. Let us understand that we must put first things first and have our houses literal and have our houses spiritually in order. It is important that you understand what I'm saying. I will review a few things that folks have been constantly calling and bombarding the, the phone and nothing is wrong. Bombard it, send the questions. I mean, call, talk to me, talk to the leaders. Don't be afraid. If you have the concerns, express it. We want to know because we want to deal with them. Yes, we have passed. The, 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 the chapters and the, sorry, the sessions that deals with heaven. Yes, we have passed the session that deals with what is going to be happening when the rapture takes place and we are up in heaven. Your folks have still been bombarding and asking to expand a little, a little bit more. It is clear to me that folks are a little uncomfortable with some of these parts and we will rehearse a little bit. And I say a little bit because we can go back to the past uh, sessions because they are tips, they are online, and update ourselves. But just to expand a little bit by virtue of the questions that keep com com uh, coming back to us, constantly coming, it is signaling to me that folks want to understand particularly these areas a little bit more because somehow they strike home. Uh, a few saints have said to me, Sir, if it is that God is going to judge us for works done in this life, we are going to have a problem. If it is that folks are, uh, that Jesus is going to govern what we do, um, and govern where we ultimately and what we ultimately get by virtue of what we did in this life. I have a problem. That's what they are saying. But it doesn't matter how we look at it. It doesn't matter how we try to dissect it. It doesn't matter how we try to analyze it. The Bible is very clear that we are going to be judged in heaven for things that we did right here on earth. And I am going to go back through that just to bring some clarity, just to reiterate and to reinforce what was said because this is Bible. This is fact. Folks say they don't believe that it is going to be that way because when we are in heaven, we will not know each other and we will not know anybody. Well, we are going to, maybe when we did the presentation the last time, we were unclear on some things. We are going to put a few more scriptures to you. We are going to uh, reinforce the scriptures that we looked at last week, and we are going to make it be abundantly clear to you that all of us are going to have to stand before him I remember the Apostle Paul speaking to some of the saints. And when they accuse him, you know, who are you? You keep imposing yourself on us. And I mean, who make it you yourself out to be? And Paul had to, in defense of himself, say, look, I will not even defend myself here. But I leave everything for that great day. And on that day, 
that they will declare it. You will understand that while I might be doing these things, it is not of myself. Paul was saying, and he indicated to the saints to whom he spoke, that that day, that day of judgment, that day of reckoning, when the saints stand before the beamer, the judgment seat of Christ, that day will declare that he was not doing anything of himself. So if that day was going to vindicate Paul, it means that Paul knew that when he stands up there and those that were accusing him in relation to those matters stood there too, they are going to understand that he was in fact right. So Paul will know that he's Paul up there. And the people in whose eyes he would have been vindicated will realize that Paul indeed was correct. So they will know Paul. And Paul will know them. And the vindication will take place. And everybody will understand it was so. So let us not be fooled into believing that we will not know each other. We will not know anything. And so we can do anything here and we're going to get away with it. Uh-uh. We are going to give account, every one of us. So we, are, we will take a quick look at that again. Right? And we will understand just how the things will flow. So I will just review probably two or three. And only because the questions have been coming clearly. There is more that folks need to know clearly. There are things that people are not convinced about as it relates to the judgment seat, as it relates to the marriage supper, as it relates to heaven itself, as it relates to uh, we recognizing each other, as it relates to the fact that we will not be spiritual beings floating around in heaven, but we will be real physical persons we will be ourselves and we will know each other. And this is Bible and the scriptures are there to back up what exactly it is that I'm saying. And so the, we will go back to, chapters, to, to question 7. And question 7 incorporates a number of others. As we turn to the slide, we will be expanding and it and a few others. I'll put those questions together and you just follow me with the scriptures as I go back through and as I expand and make it abundantly clear. It doesn't matter if it's hard to swallow. It doesn't matter if it is difficult to embrace and receive. It is important that we understand the concept, that we understand that it is Bible, I, and I quite understand the fact that this generates some amount of fear. But then, it ought to do that. Many of us are living fearless and as a result, dangerously. The things that we do here and now in this life, brothers and sisters, we are going to have to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are going to have to face him, and we are going to have an eyeball contact with the King of glory, and we are going to have to explain and give an account of ourselves, of our stewardship to him. Don't believe that because pastor is not seeing you. Don't believe that because brother Daly and brother Bailey and brother whoever our leaders are, are not seeing. Don't believe that because others are not seeing. I must understand that I too will have to give an account of my stewardship and give an account for the people of God. I understand that clearly. And if we are, have been fooled and lulled into complacency because we believe that what we do we are doing in secret it will be secret no but when we stand before god we are going to have a lot of explaining to do we are going to have a lot of accounting to do we are going to have a lot 
to talk to the king about as it relates to our lives. So let us look at the first slide uh, with question number seven. Question number seven. And I will expand beyond what you see there in terms of the question and in terms of the, the different <clears throat> questions that were being asked by other saints of God. The question is, when we get to heaven, will we have real bodies or will we be spirit beings? Well, brothers and sisters, I would like us to understand that we will have real bodies. Bodies that can be touched, bodies that we can see, bodies that we can recognize. We will be who we are now, except that we will have a glorious body and we will be in consciousness at a level not known to man. Right now, we are limited with the things that we can comprehend. We are limited in terms of the things that we can fathom. But we know, all of us, I know that I am Garfield daily. I am composed of body, soul, and spirit as it is here now. And I know me. I am me. If I get a cut, I hurt. If I do something wrong, I know. If I get a reward right now and get, as a result of doing some great job, I get a bonus and it goes to my bank account, I know. And this is in the realm of the natural where we are now. I am submitting to you, saints of God, that when we get into the higher realm, when we get into the other realm, while it is a spiritual realm and it is different from this material world, it is spiritual because it has no sin there. It is spiritual because that is where the abode of the living God. It is spiritual because it is the abode of angels and spiritual beings. But I would like us to understand that the place where we are going is the very place where Jesus is is even at this point in time and we all know that jesus when he was resurrected and then and therefore in his glorified state we all know that he was body yes he was flesh yes he was bones yes the bible makes that abundantly clear in fact we did not look at it last week but i'm going to use the opportunity today and i'm going to share with us from the book of saint luke saint luke chapter number 24 it's not on the ch chart as you will see there because i'm expanding a little bit as i said based on the additional questions that have come in and just to uh, give a little bit more so that we can understand clearly the assertions that I'm making and the things that I am submitting to you. And so Luke chapter number 24 and verse 39 tells us something. Uh, if, if we start from verse 38, uh, it says, And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do... Thoughts arise in your hearts. You see, what happened? They are now seeing Jesus. And all of a sudden, everybody got scared. Yes, they are seeing him. They're, they're, all kind of things were going through their thoughts. Can this really be? Is this Jesus? Because he died the other day. But now they are seeing the man alive. They are seeing the man, the man bodily. They are seeing the man directly in front of them. And Jesus is saying, don't be troubled. And why do thoughts arise in your heart? He then go on to verse 39 and says, Behold, 
my hands yes and my feet that it is i myself he knew who he was and he showed them his hands and he showed them his feet and then he went on to say handle me and see for a spirit so clearly they were troubled in their minds and they were thinking that they were seeing a spirit they were thinking that they were seeing a ghost all kind of things came to their minds and jesus was now comforting them and said don't be troubled don't let these things arise in your mind look here it is i myself he knew he who he was and he was telling them who he was based on what he saw going through their minds so he said anger me and see see my hands see my feet touch me hold me look at me good is me for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. So he was quite clear that he, Jesus, knew he was who he was. He told them who he was. They saw who he was. They understood now that it was he. They then proceeded to touch his hands and his feet so that he was flesh and they, Jesus then said unto them, look, this is not a spirit. This is not me in a spirit form. This is me in bodily form. Yes? And you have touched me, and you have felt me, and you can see and know and understand that this is me my very self good then i want us also to turn in our bibles to the book of saint john saint john chapter 20 right saint john chapter 20 and we read verse verses 26 and 27 and it is important we i think we touched on it last week but let us quickly go through Again, I am making the point that the resurrected body, again, I am making the point that the resurrected glorified body is very important that we understand that concept because Jesus set the pace and we will see from the scripture above. In fact, we might just look at it before we read St. John chapter 20. We must understand that the very body that Jesus had, the very glorified body that Jesus had, is the same type of body that you and I will have as saints of the Most High God. And the Bible speaks to it, and we will look at it in a quick, in a minute, um, to be very clear that we get that point. So, so St. John chapter 20 verses 26 and 27 and here is what it says and after eight days again his disciples were within and thomas with them then came jesus the doors being shut now i want us to understand this the doors were shut everywhere was shut the point that was being made here they were locked on the inside and all of them were there, including Thomas, who before was doubting when he heard that Jesus was alive and was with them physically, bodily. And so here the Bible says, the door being shut, then came Jesus and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and trust it into my side, and be not faithless, but 
believing Jesus in his resurrected state in as much as they were able to touch him and to feel him and to trust their hands into his side and therefore recognize and acknowledge that he is indeed body and not spirit. Understand this, although the doors were shut, although they were locked away inside that room, the Bible said Jesus stood right in their midst with everywhere being locked up. The resurrected body, although he was not spirit and he was body, he had the capacity in this new glorified state to move through walls, to move through barriers, and to be in the midst of any situation, in the midst of people, even though they were locked away. And he made it clear to them that he was not spirit. It is I. Touch me and see. Feel me. Feel my hands. Feel my feet. And yet with everywhere locked up, he was able to walk through the walls, walk through the barriers, and stand in the midst of the people. Brothers and sisters, saints of God, I am submitting to you that this is Bible and that this is real and that this is going to be the form, the kind of body, the glorified body that you and I will have. This is Bible. Let us look at the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter number 3 and it's on the screen. Verses 20. Uh, yes. And, and, and in fact, let us just read to make that little point that I want to make. For the Bible said, Philippians 3 verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven. From whence we look. For the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. That is Bible. That is Word. Yes? And it is important that we understand this concept that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself so verse 20 and 21 is very important read them to together for our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the savior the lord jesus christ so when he comes out of the cloud and he calls us we are going to be changed according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We are going to be changed. Changed to what? When we are changed, verse 21 here of Philippians chapter 3 tells us, Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So we are going to be like him. Yes, we are going to be like him. And hear what the Apostle John says about this also. So we are still talking about the state, the form that we are going to be in uh, when we are in our resurrected state. And hear what the Apostle John has to say about this in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is brothers and sisters we shall be like him brothers and sisters we shall be like him we shall have bodies fashioned like unto his glorious body and notice notice we did say what kind of body his was 
He could walk through the walls and be in the midst of the disciples. Yes, they could touch him. They could feel him. They could see him. They recognized him. They knew that it was Jesus. He knew that these were his disciples. And this is just the plain, unadulterated truth. Do not let anybody tell you, saints of God, that you are going to be spirits floating around. We shall be changed. Yes? We will not be disembodied spirits floating around on clouds. We will not be disembodied spirits not knowing each other. And all we are going to be doing is looking at Jesus and singing for all eternity. No. We are going to be fashioned. We are going to be clothed with a body. Not this one that we have. Because this is corruptible. And this corruptible will die and will be changed. And we will become incorruptible in our new bodies. Fashioned like unto his glorious body. And these will be real. They will be flesh. They will be bones. We will be able to touch each other. We will be able to see each other. We will be able to recognize each other. This is Bible. Yes? And so the book of St. John. And without going back. In fact, if you look at question 8, there are some scriptures there. Right? If we flip the chart, there are some scriptures there that tell us, that makes it clear to us, yes, that we will be able to recognize each other. We will be able to see each other. We will be able to know each other. And that is very important. That is very important. Now, when we met last week, we did say, we did say, that one, Jesus called the disciples together, yes, and said to them, come and dine. They had just caught a big catch. And as big as the catch was, the net did not break. And Jesus called them together and said, come and dine. Yes. And brothers and sisters, they dined that day. Not only will this body be real. Not only will we see each other and know each other. But we, because it is a body. Yes we will have the capacity, we will have the, what it takes to eat and to drink, so that when the Bible, because this is one of the questions that constantly come in and have been coming since last week, when the Bible said that we are going to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, folks were saying that, Pastor, that's a spiritual thing, it just means that we're going to have a grand time in the presence of God. But no, it is not just a spiritual thing. The, it is a real marriage supper. And I will just reiterate it. It is a real marriage supper. It is a real banquet. We are going to sit around the table with Jesus, our bridegroom. And we are going to feast. And we are going to fellowship. And we are going to have the time of our lives. In any relationship that culminates in marriage, in any relationship that has its consummation in marriage. In our regular Western custom, we go through, yes, and we have the ceremony, we make the vows, and when the vows are through, we go right into the celebration, yes? We call it the, the banquet, yes, after the vows are made, we go to the hotel or we go wherever and we have the banquet. It is the same thing. And when we go to the banquet, it is a time when we celebrate. It is a time when we, the, the, the moderator that is there, talk about the bride and the groom. 
and jokes are given and we laugh and we celebrate and we have a grand time and we feast and we eat and we drink. Brothers and sisters, what we are doing in the Western world is very similar to what happens in the Eastern world. To the time when Jesus was there and the time before Jesus was there. What we are seeing today, what is described in the Bible uh, as us going to the marriage supper of the Lamb is something that was prefigured in the actual events that took place here on earth. They were real events. They were real situations. They were real marriages. People joining themselves together in holy matrimony. And the experiences that happened here is going to be the experience that you and I have when the Lord takes us via the rapture to heaven to sit with him and to bask in the presence of that place that he has gone to prepare for us. It is spiritual to the extent that it is not in this natural world. It is in a different domain. It is in a different sphere. It is in a different environment, a spiritual environment. And so the environment is spiritual. But what is spiritual when the Bible talks about streets of gold? Gold is a physical element. And if God is going to make the streets of gold that we are going to walk upon, the, when the Bible describes heaven, it is a real place and it is real people that are real bodily people, except that it is a new glorified body and we are going to walk on streets of gold, real gold, real street, real place. Heaven is beautiful. Heaven has trees. Heaven has flowers. Heaven has all the contraptions that we see and experience on earth that makes earth for some people beautiful. Folks talk about the rivers and the falls. Heaven will have its rivers flowing. And if you want to understand the beauty of heaven, the Bible did not go into the descriptions except for when it tells us of the foundations and how the streets were going to be of pure gold and how the river of life flow and you just imagine rivers flowing the waterfalls like the niagara imagine the rivers that flow and the beauty and the freshness that emanates from uh the flowing river and all the things that we see as those waters water the sides and the flowers blossom and the flowers bloom the things that we see here on earth in terms of beauty, the roses of Sharon, the lilies of the valley. God just spewed these things out to give us a glimpse of what he can do. The best is yet to come. What we are seeing here on earth in terms of the beautiful gardens and the beautiful rivers flowing and the falls and all those things. And folks take picture of the most uh, beautiful scenes. And say, look how earth is beautiful. Look what man has done in terms of manicuring this garden. Brothers and sisters, heaven is going to be worth it all. Because when we get there, we are going to see gardens that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. We are going to see flowers. We are going to see colors. We are limited. We are limited at this time in terms of colors yes what makes up the color scheme that we see here is probably about seven colors and we blend them together to get all the different colors that we now have but when we get to heaven color beauty gold diamond pearl sapphire the things that folks tend to kill each other for here in jamaica here on this earth are the things that we are going to walk on that will make our gates, that will be in the foundation of our house. Brothers and sisters, I don't know how folks for one night of immorality, I don't know how folks for one night or a week 
of carnival activity will give up their salvation for that. Give up their salvation to have a bottle of smirn of ice at a party with their friends. I don't know our saints will give up the treasures of heaven for one moment of pleasure that only takes an hour, half hour, five minutes, depending on who you are. And trade that for an eternity in the presence of the king where there is going to be real beauty forevermore. I shall know him and he will know me. Heaven is real. Heaven is for real. And I just want to reinforce this to all the folks that have been writing and saying, Sir, is it really real? Yes, it is real. We're not going to be spirits floating away don't knowing each other. I shall know him. I shall know him. When redeemed by his side, I shall stand. And he shall know me. And brothers and sisters, we will know each other. And I have to let you know that. So yes, let me answer the question again. When we get to heaven, when the rapture takes place and we get there, we are going to know each other. We are going to have bodies fashioned like unto his glorious body. And we are going to sit with him. First, we are going to be at the judgment seat of Christ so that we can give an account. Yes, brothers and sisters, we will give an account to God. I won't have to read those scriptures again, but it is there in the book of Corinthians. Look back at the session last week. It is there in the book of Romans. Look back at the slides last week. And we have sent them to you. We will. We will have to give an account to God for the way and the things that we have done in this life. And I therefore take this opportunity to tell you, to say to myself, get it together. We can turn around and get serious right now, today. Let all the other days pass. But as of now, it's not just about hearing prophecy and hearing end time stories and events. It is about getting our houses in order and aligning ourselves with the word of God. And every child of God, as you take your time and go through, as we go through this together, I am being clear again tonight. I am saying emphatically, I am saying surely, I am be and on this point, I am being very dogmatic. And I say emphatically, yes, we will not be spirits, we will have bodies. Emphatically, yes. I am saying to us, we will stand before God and give an account for the things that we have done in our lives in terms of our service to God and how we live and serve him since we have become Christians. Emphatically, yes, I am saying to us that he is going to present to us our motives, our actions, what drove our actions, the heart and the motive, emphatically yes and we are going to have to show and declare our faithfulness it is required of stewards that a man be found faithful i challenge the heart of the saint of god i challenge the heart of every christian right now let us take stock i pause Right now, end time teaching. I pause right now, prophecy teaching. And I want to inject into the spirit of the saints of God, into all of our spirits right now. Because the, I believe it is question 14, if we can find it. It embodies a number of questions that came Sir, I am not ready. I don't feel ready. And I thought I was. What must I do? 
And so the spirit of prophecy is emerging. And spirit makes men. Yes? What we have presented has a certain spirit behind it. It is, it is being presented for us to understand the things that will surely come. Don't be scared. You see, what is happening? Folks are being scared when they hear about the Antichrist being, um, coming. Yes, we will be. But don't be scared about that. Don't be scared because we hear the mark of the beast is coming. It's coming. We shouldn't allow that to scare us. The truth is, because of the reality of these facts, it propels folks, it draws us up, and it pushes us to inquire and to dig deeper. And because of what is to come, it drives a certain amount of fear. But the real fear should not be that. The real fear is what causes us to become sober. Yes? If we become sober out of what we have been discussing over the last couple of weeks, we would have achieved our objective. The objective is not merely to pass on information. Yes, that is so important. But the real objective, the real goal, is to inject a spirit of expectation and imminency of the Lord's return into our system to the extent that we focus on Jesus in a way that we have never focused on him before. Now is the time to make it right with God. Now is the time to see exactly where we are. Now is introspection time. Now is stop taking time. So the questions that came in and what I was going to do on the millennium and the questions that are coming on Antichrist and, and Mark of the Beast uh, and the earthquakes to come and the tribulation period, that becomes secondary because if we know all of those things and our hearts are not right, and I fear for the saints because I know that many folks, I know that many of us are not at the place that we ought to be. And this is driving fear in us when what it should be doing is driving us closer to God. The real fear should be, what if the trumpet sounds? And we are not ready. Because one of the questions that came is, if we miss the rapture, do we have another chance? The answer is no. Don't let anybody fool you that you will have a chance after the rapture. I know that there are different schools of thoughts and different matters. And I will not pursue this matter as if this is the only school of thought. There are some things that are open for discussion. We can look at them scripturally. We can look at them prayerfully. We can look at them as brothers and sisters. But there are some things that are clear-cut. And I'm saying to us, one of those clear-cut things is if we miss the rapture, because this is the church is. This is the dispensation of grace. And it closes when the Lord comes for us. And when the trumpet sounds and the church ages close and the dispensation of grace which the church is in is closed, don't believe that you will have another chance. Why should you get two and everybody else get one? It is appointed unto man once to die. Understand the context of the scripture. But the principle is one chance. And we might be fooling ourselves if we believe that if we miss it at the rapture, we will give ourselves fully to it in the tribulation period and we will become tribulation saints. So we're going to come back to prophecy and end time teaching after this, you know, where we're going to talk to us about who those tribulation saints are. And we're going to talk about who the 144,000 persons are. And we're going to talk about who are those in the tribulation period that were beheaded for the word of God. We're going to talk about that. But we pause 
all of that this evening for us to understand that what is most important is not knowing all of these things and the time and the sequencing and the chronology and line upon line and scriptures in order. That is not the primary focus. That is an important focus. In fact, that is a very critical part of why we are doing what we are doing. But the primary objective is that you and I shake off what we must shake off. Cut off what we must cut off. Stop the lying. Stop the backbiting. Stop the bad living. You know, I have something to talk about marriages, you know. The same marriage that Jesus and the church is going to consummate. Understand that there is a principle established from the beginning right unto this time. And if Jesus can be forgiving to you, we need to understand that we are Christians in our marriages. Push and make it happen. Do our best and let it work. These terrible things can happen. But gracious is God. And gracious he expects us to be. Yes, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Those children that are outside of the will of God by virtue of how we are working with our parents. Be careful if the trumpet come and we can sounds and we continue to live lives that are not pleasing and that are not aligned with the word. Remember, I sit here today and I am telling you, saints of God, I speak the truth in Christ. I lie not. I speak to you and I speak to myself. Yes? And I say, let us align ourselves to the word of God. I'm going to be closing shortly. Because I've put a pause to, to all that is being said. Let us look at the screen. Because I want us to be clear on something. A question is asked. A question has been asked. I don't, let's go to 14. That's 14. A question is, was asked. You know, Pastor Daly... I hear all that is being said, and I'm learning, and I'm advancing, and I thank God. But I don't know. I just feel empty. I just feel dry. I, I, what, what can I do? What, what major thing can I do? What major thing can I do? What is it that I must do? To get things back in order. To get things where, you know, God will hear me. God will answer me. God will just work in my favor. Question 16. God will work in my favor. God will see me. What must I do? And a couple of the folks that have been calling, their hearts are burdened. And it's one of the reasons why I paused just to inject this little thought to us. Sir, do you think I can make it? Because I keep doing some things. And sir, do you think I can make it? Because I, I realize I should be in ministry and I am not. Sir, do you think I can make it? Because I don't know. And, I, and, you know, folks are crying. I don't want us to cry in that sense, brothers and sisters. I don't want us to cry. What I want to happen is I want us to recognize that the words that are being presented the things that are being taught are being done so that you and I can do the simple things, the small things 
Because it is small things, brothers and sisters, right? Walking day by day. It is little things that we must do that will add up and make us great. Don't look to do anything massive and great and mighty and, and big and that will usher you into that place where if the trumpet sounds, you're gone off to heaven. No, it is not like that. I want us, and I don't want us to feel that, oh, Jesus, look how pastor is teaching these things, and he has the leaders there with him, and oh, they are making it, and they don't understand the trials and the troubles and the, the fightings within and without. All of us have these fightings within, within and without. But I'm saying to us that, look, the question is asked, sir, we are so distracted. We can't keep focused. We, we, our children are, 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 are attracted to all kind of things in the world. Can I tell us? And, and, and it's a simple word, you know. Titus 2 tells us, verses 11 to 13, and it's on the screen. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present evil world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, it is a day-by-day -day walk. It is a, there's a page two that I want us to, to, to look at scenes. Yes, it is a day-by-day -day walk saints of God. The Bible teaches us that we must deny. Yes, it teaches us that we must turn away from. It teaches us that indeed, and when the Bible instructs us, like what it instructs us, instructs us in Titus 2, that we must deny ungodliness and worldly loss, and that we should live soberly. The Bible wouldn't give us instruction and advice on things that we are unable to do. We all, saints of God, have the capacity inside of us. We have that potential simply because we have the Holy Ghost. You know, I want to say these things to us now because I know that we are all open to receive teaching. That ancient Greek word, as you're seeing there for teaching, has in mind what a parent does for a child. So when we talk about teaching us to be holy, teaching us to be prayerful, teaching us to get into the word, all we are trying to do is to take us through a training process, which all of us must be a part of right what is in mind when we are talking about teaching is for us to be encouraged for us to correct people for us to discipline people and for us to be disciplined in the things that we do and all of us has the capacity to learn to be teachable to be encouraged to be corrected we are not holding a big stick over any saint head Far from us. Uh, no, no, no. What we want to do is to push us and to propel us. All of us can make it. Can I sit here this evening and declare and tell those that are listening that all of us can make it? I love to share a scripture from the book of Jeremiah. I love to share from the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter 4 and verse 10. As I gear up to close. For who hath despised the day of small things? I use that scripture. And I want to join that scripture with another one from the book. And just make note of it. Because it's not on the screen. But I'm just injecting this here as I do feel it. I want to join that scripture with one from the book of Songs of Solomon chapter number 2 and verse 15 it says take us the foxes the little foxes that spoil the vines 
for our vines have tender grapes. We need to understand a little principle, scenes of God. Don't despise the day of small things and be careful of the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines. All of us are a part of a vineyard. All of us have been given a vineyard to tend to. And there is no vineyard saints of God that will blossom. That will blossom. There is no vineyard saint of God that will come to anything if that vineyard is not properly tilled and tended to. If that vineyard is not properly groomed and trimmed and is taken care of. Yes, many times we look out for the, the, the big animals. Yes, the hyenas and the lions and we put up big ticket fences to keep out the big animals to protect our vineyards. But we plant the post and we put the barbed wires around and little spaces are left where the lions cannot enter through where the hyenas cannot enter through, where the goats and the sheep cannot enter through to eat down the little vines that are coming up from which we will get our grapes. But although we put the barbed wire fences around and we leave, and we leave little spaces that the larger animals cannot come through, Songs of Solomon and incidentally, that entire story is a love story it is a song being sung between two persons in love yes and it reflects and represents the relationship that you and I have with the bridegroom himself yes and we all have a garden we all have responsibility we all have what is required to till our gardens properly. And I then say to us saints of God. Understand. The space might be small. And you might feel good that you are keeping out the big things. But it is not the big things. That bring. And tear. The vineyard down. It is the little things. I break. The. Lessons and prophecy to interject and inject into our spirit at this time when we are so interested, when we are so excited about ten, uh, end time affairs. I pause to inject into our spirit that little foxes can come through the small spaces, and it is the little foxes that oil the vine yes yes they are small and they can push the grape vine over but those foxes dig at the ground and eat into the ground and destroy the root of those vines those vines are to be producing grapes that will end up giving us wine yes the wine is the end result the wine is what people drink. The wine is what makes men merry. The wine is what brings the money. The wine is the end result of the grapes. And it causes such a great and manifold multiplication in terms of end result. But none of those end results will be there if the grapes die. And it is not the big animals that will destroy the grapes. It is the small foxes that when we put up the fence and we run the barbed wire around and leave the little spaces, the little foxes come through. The little things. A little folly. A little frivolous action. Yes. A little lie. Little things can cause big things to tumble down. A little visit to the witch of Endor. 
save a little of the animals that should have been slain. And it resulted in the fall of a mighty kingdom. Little things. When the servant of Abraham went to find a wife for Abraham's son Isaac, his test was, the woman that gives me water, if she also asks or suggested that she will give water to the camel, she would be the one. And that woman, when she enjoined herself to Isaac, will cause the generation flow to continue. And when that lady came out and the servant saw her, he said, could you give me a little water? And she followed everything that he did. And he recognized that this was the woman that was to be the wife of Isaac. And his litmus test was give me a little water. A little water. And the course of history continued. And the great nation of Israel came into being shortly thereafter. A little water. When God was going to do mighty miraculous things, Things and shave his people through the time of drought. He sent Elijah down to a widow woman. And when he got to her, he said, give me a little water. Give me a morsel of bread. Yes? And she gave him a little water. A morsel of bread. And that little thing... Turn the course of history. Little things. Despise not small things. Understand that concept. Despise not small things. And understand that it is the little foxes that spoil the vine. Brothers and sisters, in answer to those questions, what must we do? Little things. Little things. There's a scripture as I close. And I close now. There is a scripture in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10. And I'm gearing up. What I mentioned a while ago with the servant of Abraham going down to get the wife of Isaac. You can find that in Genesis chapter 24 verses 14 to 19. Write it down and look at it. A little water, little things, the power of little things. The scripture in relation to Elijah going down to the widow woman and ask her for a little water and also a morsel of bread. Little things. Find it in 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 9 to 16. Little water, little piece of bread. Change the course of history. Very important concept. And then I then ask us to understand a simple scripture from, and I get that to you shortly, it's the book of Proverbs. But there is an indication in it that we must not remove the old landmark. I believe it is Proverbs chapter number 22. And ver Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 28. Simple things as I close. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 28. Can we show it? All right. So Proverbs chapter 22. Just, just make a note of it. We don't have to show it. Just make a note of it, brethren. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 28. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. What are the ancient landmarks? I close with them. One. Never forget that it is a must child of God, that we be people of prayer. 
always be impressed. Simple things. It might appear small. It might appear prayer, but that's just talking to God. It's not just talking to God. Everything about our connection with heaven, our maintenance in terms of our spirituality, everything about that has to do with our prayer life. The concept is clear. Daniel was in prayer. He prayed three times a day. It didn't matter who, when the king gave the instructions to cut it out. He did not stop. And he prayed still. It was the ancient landmark. He opened his windows as normal. Three times a day at the set time each day. Saints of God, set a prayer time and stick to it. Follow it. Be a soldier with it. Be regimental. We are soldiers and soldiers deal with discipline. Don't pray ad hoc times unless you have a set time and then you drop in other times in between, which the Bible says pray always and be constantly in prayer. Nothing wrong with that. But have a set time when we get together with God and allow him to come find us at that place and at the set time, at the appointed time. There's a principle in that. And I challenge the saints of God as I break from prophecy to inject this into our spirit spirits let us have a set prayer time don't remove the ancient landmark daniel set it up for us and so prayer is one simple but profound and powerful two fasting don't forget to fast some things will not happen except by prayer and fasting and it is important that we understand that we must mortify this body. We cannot overcome. We cannot have the victory. We cannot have the preeminence over the flesh. Because we are not fasting. Prayer coupled with fasting. And I'm just I'm feeling led to inject this into our spirits. Saints of God in Jamaica and overseas. Wherever you are. Pray. Fast. And seek the face of God. We combine this. Uh, we will become formidable and the enemy will have to flee and take note of who we are. We have the power and it's not big things. It is simple things like praying, fasting, and the third ancient landmark, the word of Almighty God. Read it every day. Study it every at a set period. We we'll probably can't study it every single day. But even if it's every week, we we'll do some study. Even if it's every two weeks, we we'll do some study. Study something from the word of God at a set period, sequential period. Set up the time and put study hours together. Read it every day. Study it at set period, periods. And we will be surprised at where this takes us. So prayer, fasting, and the word, and then we're going to live a certain kind of dedicated life. Holiness unto the Lord, dedicated in our service, get involved in ministry. It don't matter where you are, it don't matter who you are, let us get involved in ministry. This is not about just coming to church. We realize that we can't even come to church now. And if, if coming to church was what kept people Sorry for some people right now. Oh God. But this is about personal experience. This is about knowing God for ourselves. This is about my personal relationship with God. This is about fellowship with Him. And what I'm telling you right now. Don't remove the ancient landmark. Pray. Fast. Read and study the word. And live holy, dedicated lives unto the Lord. The more we do this is the more the lures of the party, undercover party, underground things that we hide and doing. Yeah, place we are hiding and going. Things we are involved in that we shouldn't be doing. Things that we are online and people that we are online with that we shouldn't be online with. The songs of the world that we have pushing into and beating into our ears through the earphone that nobody is hearing. These things are known. God sees them. I would rather to give up these things 
for a few moments, a few years, and know that I have eternity locked where I'm going to be with Jesus forever and ever and ever, enjoying the beauties of the things that he has in store for those that love him. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard the things that the Lord have prepared for those that love him. Let us live for him. When we get back together next week, we will get back into prophecy and end time things and answering the questions and making the presentation so that we can know where we are and see where we are. But we have to do what we do in the spirit and with the spirit and break when we feel that it is time to break and inject a word into the spirits and the heart of the people of God. This is what it is all about. God bless you as I close on this in Jesus' name. Before I pray, saints of God, this coming Sunday, you did hear me mention that we will have communion service. We will not do it on a Wednesday. We will not do it any other day. In our board meeting last night, uh, we discussed and agreed that we will have it on a Sunday. And brethren beloved, we are going to be having communion service this coming Sunday. And I invite all of us to be a part of it. If you are watching via the World Wide Web, you are a part of the Faith Apostolic Ministry family, uh, our friend, and you feel you are saved, and you feel that you want to be a part of communion, supper, Lord's Supper, I'm going to invite you to be a part. We are going to have a grand time. A few of us will be at church in terms of the leaders, and we will be breaking bread. What will happen, we will have the regular service, and it will be a part of the service, and so it will flow into the service, and that is very, very, very important. There's going to be one service. Remember, no, we're not going to have right under fellowship or anything like that. I believe we can still uh, wash the saints' feet, so you're going to all be at home. We will still be self-distancing because it's our families and so forth. So we will just have the regular supper and washing on the saints' feet. And of course, so the family has an opportunity to get together. You and I know that the first Passover, everybody was in their individual homes. And it all happened together. And the blood was placed on the lintel and the doorpost. And the Lord Passover was implemented that day with everybody in their individual homes. And so we are going to be in our individual homes the churches will be at home, and we are going to have communion, and we're going to have a time of fellowship. It is going to be great. It is going to be blessed. It is going to be a time where we get together as brethren and fellowship, and we are going to tie ourselves into the Lord. So it is going to be communion, and let the word go around. Tell the brethren who might not be watching tonight, just spread the word around. It is going to be a special service on Sunday and it is going to be communion and it is going to be a great time of fellowship and I invite all of us. So I am asking us to get some wine and you know we talk about grape juice. Get, we normally would use the closest thing to unleavened and it is those you know cracker that we get because we don't have unleavened bread here and the regular bread has this so as close that we can get to unleavened bread. If you can get some unleavened bread, get it. But as close as we can get to that, the cracker that we always use doesn't have much leaven in it. Or if, if it's just to get some cracker, because what we are going through, we are symbolizing, we are going through the symbolism of the supper. But have the wine, have the bread or the cracker, and we are going to be doing this thing together this coming Sunday. And it will be a time of fellowship. It will be a time of breakthrough. It will be a time of opening up to God. And let it be a moment that we take to rededicate ourselves to him. Given that we broke this evening and injected some things into our spirit. I personally believe 
that every child of God, if we make our minds up, we just need a made up mind, we can make it in the rapture. We can be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I challenge our hearts. So let us make up in our minds to do what we must do and not remove the old landmark. And let us, as an extension of what we are going to be doing in terms of introspection tonight, let us gear up to be in communion on Sunday and have that to be an extension of our humbling ourselves before God, of our remembering exactly who he is, of our remembering exactly what he has done, and use it as a moment to rededicate and recommit ourselves to him. Because that is what all of this and all that we are teaching about, that's what it's all about. God bless you. Real good in Jesus' name. Thank you, mighty God, for another evening where your people can listen to the words of the living God. Thank you for your saints. I pray that you will inject into our hearts and into our spirits right now the things that must be there, that must reside there for us to be saints of the Most High God and to be ready when you come. Help us to pray. Help us to fast. Help us to get into the Word. Help us to live holy and dedicated lives to you, mighty God. We commit the saints. We commit all of us into your hands. Lead us, mighty God. Have your own way. Do your work. Accomplish your will in our lives. Let the church go on and let great things abound in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Have your own way. Thank you, mighty God. We close now and bless your people. Bless us abundantly. Help us to do what is right and help us to make it in the rapture. That's the purpose of the church and we are in the church of the, at this time. Help us to stay in and to do what must be done to make it in the rapture. Oh, that our calling and our election will be sure. Thank you, Jesus. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. God bless you, beloved. God bless you, saints of the Most High God. People of a great God. My father's children, I bless you. The, the, the blessings of Abraham. The blessings uh, that of Aaron. The blessings of Deuteronomy 28. May it rest upon every one of you in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Real good in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.